YouTube, what's up? So, so grateful that you clicked and you're about to watch a new YouTube video, but before you do, 212-931-5731. That is my texting community platform. I'm doing a lot of one-on-one engagement in there and also access, opportunity, first looks in that environment. 212-931-5731. Join it now and now to the video you've been wanting to watch. In today's climate and society, I promise you the following. You wanna find a lot of negativity, it's very easy. On the flip side, a much more unpopular opinion is if you wanna find a lot of happiness and opportunity, you can find it very easily. You decide. You got your perspective. I just wanna be happy, don't you wanna be happy? Gary, why don't we start off by, why don't you tell them a little bit about what VaynerMedia is? Uh, you know, obviously saw in the video, you know, I try to make it as simple as possible. All, all we really are is a uh, agency. You know, I think what makes us different is because I didn't come from the agency landscape and more importantly, because I built VaynerMedia with the intent to be a platform for buying businesses and brands during the next economic downturn it's been built very differently. The first thing that was different was that we have media and creative under one house, not part of a holding company where it's separate companies, but from day one, it was built where both media and creative sit together and the context and the end consumer is truly, not through reporting, not through data, but truly at the forefront and we think about math and art as friction to create diamonds, not one is more valuable than the other. And then really the only other big variable difference is it's you know, a dictatorship, you know? (laughs) And what I mean by that is I don't have a board, I don't have a holding co. Everything wrong at Boehner is 100% my fault and uh, when when something's run by an entrepreneurial operator, um, a lot of good can happen um, in growth and a lot of growing pains and silly young things happen and um, I, I definitely think we're dramatically more contemporary than every alternative at the global scale. We have Singapore, London, you know, we have a thousand people. You know, it's not a small company. I I spend a lot of time actually strategically making it about me. Look over here, look at this crazy guy so that I can operate something that I think is quite disruptive over here. Um, And I'm proud of that. Um, But it's a, I think it's a very different shop because it comes from a very different agenda you know, we're not held accountable to every 90 day finance goals. And I think that has been a massive uh, advantage. Yeah. No quarterly earnings, though. No. <laughs> and no getting on a call with analysts and appeasing some short term narrative that's an inside vigged game. Yeah. <laughs> I remember a meeting that we had at one point where you came to us and said, you know, you would bring new channels to us, for example, and when Pinterest, and you talked to us about Pinterest, and one time you came and you said, you guys gotta figure out Snapchat. You've gotta be on Snapchat, it's the future, and at that point, it was just something that my, that my kids did, and I, and I couldn't figure it out. What, what's, what's next, and what's new in that space that we should be looking at? It's interesting, Trish, even in that, it's very rare very rare, though I'm a human, I'm sure I slip up, but I would argue if we had film of me bringing up Snap at the time, that it was more likely that I didn't refer to it as the future, and I never predict. I'm just completely obsessed with right now. What I know right this second, as we sit here and everybody watching around the world, that LinkedIn and TikTok are the two platforms that give you organic reach. If you do not pay media, if you're a nobody, and you post on either one of those two platforms, something great can happen that cannot happen outside of a miracle point zero 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 one percent chance on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Those things always fascinate me because I love underpriced real estate. You know, if I came to somebody 25 years ago and said, there's an island called Turks and Caicos and I genuinely believe more people will go to it over the next 25 years and we bought a property, everybody would be happy. So I spend all my time on two core things. One, underpriced organic reach, which often is more at a small entrepreneurial SMB level. At the corporate level, they're important because I want companies to get the reps of understanding the nuances that are making this platform pop. And understanding LinkedIn today is very different than all of us understanding it four years ago. 
It's a completely different beast. LinkedIn today acts much more like Facebook did six years ago than it does with the LinkedIn that we all grew up using, which was a tool, not a content platform. Um, the things I'm learning on TikTok now will matter because those are getting instilled into 12 and 19 year olds right now and those will become nuances that quite matter in communication in three, five, seven, nine years. Obviously, Chase is less likely to be obsessed with understanding TikTok in comparison to Vans or in comparison to Mattel, right? So you, you think about all those things but I don't know what's next. What I do know is that I'm incredibly good at understanding, as a human, subjectively, intuitively, of what seems to be current and then I put a ton of discipline and work ethic and dollars and effort into proving those hypotheses to be true or false. So, shifting a little, if we think about, since it's in the news, Okay. Interested in your thoughts on Twitter's recent announcement about banning political ads without getting political in our discussion, but. I think the platforms are making a ridiculously, uh, first of all, I think it's smart. I think that platforms revenue from political ads is not significant enough in return for what the headlining and positioning means to it and all the vulnerabilities of, we are in a fully on tilt headline reading society. The amount of opinions in this room, from the two of us to everybody in this room, to everybody who's watching, where we have deep convictions and thoughts predicated on one or two headlines is laughable. Um, So A, I think it was a smart move by Jack. I think it helps Twitter. But I think that they, the platforms, have done an incredibly bad job in distinguishing what a platform is. People are way on tilt on believing that they're manipulating something. I mean, Mark's opportunity when AOC asks him, like, will you police this truth, is easily rebuttaled with, can we have CNN and Fox do that too? Like, we are, we're at a very funny place where we ask modern technologies to do things that we don't hold traditional technologies accountable for. So, great, but I think in the macro, they're doing a poor job I would, I'm very curious what the variable difference is between not fact checking an ad in a Facebook feed versus not checking a fact coming out of a news anchor's mouth on a news platform. Well, let me push back just Please. a bit. Please, please. So, I love pushing back a bit. <laughs> so we do a lot of work right now looking at the impact of bots. Okay. Um, on escalating news on social media in a way that if you just saw an article in New York Times that it might not move at the same pace. And how, how do you see bots impacting the spread of news and the spread of fake news, for example? I don't view technology any different than I look at humans. This is one big game of communication. Do we have data that shows what Carson Tucker or Don Lemon mean when they say something? That's my pushback. My pushback is when are we gonna hold ourselves accountable for the information? You know, like, you know, whether a bot is run to run more ads or more potential awareness against a headline or a newscaster uses an adjective in a way that pushes that information I genuinely do not see the variable difference to the end consumer. I would argue people are hearing what they want to hear. Right. Like, I don't know, I see plenty of things coming on Facebook and CNN and Fox and Twitter that I'm a big enough boy to decipher what I want to believe or tend to believe or I'm curious about. This notion that we're so helpless that the second that we see something, we believe it to be true, I think it's the reverse. I think we're justifying what we want to be true through the propaganda. So how should we then consume news as an educated consumer and be discerning and? By putting in the work. You know how many people here are gonna be keyboard warriors about politics and not even register to vote? (laughs) How should we do it? The same way we do everything. Remember when you blindly believed everything out of your parents' mouth? You grew up. It's time we do that with media. So 
last year you published the book Crushing It, which is a bit of an evolution from the 2009 Crush It. Thank you. <laughs> and so, <laughs> tell us about what has evolved from a trend perspective of branding. Um, what's, what's new and different now? What's stayed the same and what has died? When I wrote Crush It in 2008 and then the book came out in 2009, the thought of building a viable business or lifestyle on the back of YouTube or Twitter was a laughable event. If you go to Amazon right now and look at the first 500 reviews of Crush It that were published in 2009, basically it's a mix of this guy is completely a snake oil salesman to social media will be gone next year. There was not a belief that enough scale could happen on these platforms to create something meaningful. So what's evolved is the acceptance from the masses that there is power behind these platforms. I mean, we've gone from 2009 where people didn't believe me that these platforms were powerful enough for you to be able to make $80,000 a year to us now feeling like we have to break up these companies because they're so powerful in dictating our minds. So that's changed the perception of the power of social networks which oh by the way are just the current state of where our attention is on the internet itself. Whether this goes to AR or VR or voice all this is is where are we paying attention to. Um, you know, so that's, that's the biggest change. Um, the things that are the same are my belief that there's a lot of people here in this room watching who have a certain perspective on how they're gonna live their life and what is gonna bring the most happiness to them and I wanna continue to beat a drum of do not underestimate the power of this platform. Do not underestimate what it feels like to be desperately happy making $103,000 a year doing something you love versus being unhappy making $197,000 a year spending it on things to disguise your unhappiness. You do talk a lot on your social channels about hating your job. And while obviously everyone here loves huh. that, <laughs> I mean we all go through points whether you're on a non-traditional career path like some of the influencers that you work with or the entrepreneurs or even a more traditional path like the ones here, what, what advice, what, what could we learn for those of us on a more traditional path from the non-traditional folks that you work with? Um, you know, it's funny. It's really hard to ask a giraffe to be a penguin or vice versa. And so one thing that's become much more obvious to me as I've gotten older is like, wow, DNA is powerful. Like, I'm so comfortable with no and losing and fear, but I'm so empathetic to people that aren't. I, and this will surprise a lot of you that maybe follow me, I'm unbelievably comfortable with aggressiveness and candor and binary talk on stage, but one-on-one, -on -one, I've really struggled over the last 25 years as an executive with radical candor and shooting it straight because I'm so optimistic and I'm always trying to fix it. And so that's taken me a lot of work. And through that work, it, I'm like, okay, you know, there's the things that come natural and the things that aren't. If you grew up in a framework with parents or customs that really desperately overvalue outside affirmation, the opinions of your parents' parents or siblings because you come from, a, let's call it what it is, an immigrant background where there's a huge commonality there, um, school, you were so deeply bought into school that the short-term affirmation of every 90 days with grades and report cards made you comfortable. It's very hard to then go into, hey, hey, this is what you should learn from entrepreneur land. Like, don't worry about it, it's all gonna be fine. That's very hard. You've fully built yourself as an animal to completely value outside judgment that is not based on the market but based on another human being. That's what I'd like people to learn which is like, hey, like, what are we doing here? You've won the 400 trillion to one lottery of being a human being. Do you really want to live with regret? Like, do you not understand that the internet is the greatest optionality in the history of mankind? That our grandparents and everybody behind them had nowhere close to the options you sit with today? And really, like, what are you valuing that's making you conform into doing something that doesn't make you happy? Your current overhead? So sell your home and rent. That sounds crazy. You know, when I started talking about like, hey, in the pursuit of happiness, would you consider selling your home and renting? 
I mean, I got destroyed in the comments sections and a lot of the play, like, like that I'm some horrible person. I'm like, how is living your life to pay the bills that you've created for yourself? That's all humans, all that humans do are create their own jails and then live within it. That's all we do. So, so knowing that that's very hard in a human way, the situation you have with your parents, all that stuff, the professional one feels like I have a prayer of communicating that and letting people, and here's my point. If you wanna be a professional skier or if you wanna start a, a blog or podcast around cooking, my big thing is if you jump and start swimming, you know, this is riding a bike, kissing a boy or girl or, or, or you know, swimming. This is, it seems super scary until you do it and then you just laugh about why it felt so scary. Like if you go do that thing and live more humble, live with judgment, you could always get a job again. Like, I don't know, like I just, my great fear is regret. Because it is the obvious thing I see in people that are 80 to 100 years old that seems super scary. (laughs) Nobody was thrilled that they played it safe. It just, you don't see it. And I think people should spend more time with 80 to 100 year olds that aren't their grandparents. (laughs) I mean it, I mean it. I think people need context on life a little bit. I think people have a horrible relationship with time. Do you know how many people in this room are scared shitless of 30? Like it's some thing, it means nothing. But our society has decided to tell you that you have to figure it out and married and children and what are you talking about? 98% of the 59 year olds I know don't have it figured out. The hell are we supposed to have it all figured out at 30? 25, like people are making terrible decisions. Getting married because they think they're supposed to by this age. You know, like buying homes because they think they're supposed, like the rules of modern society have led to, everybody wants to blame technology, you know, and drug companies for, you know, all our problems. We need to blame our norms, our expectations, our ridiculous North Stars that have, make no sense. We're living, when I look at this young of a crowd, they're living to 110. There's an enormous amount of people in here that are gonna live to 110 and are freaking out that they don't have it figured out by 30. You're not even a fucking quarter of the way there yet. (laughs) What are we talking about? So in, you know, that's very heady stuff. In its practical layer of, of business and life and jobs and career, I think everybody owes it to themselves to start something on the side around something that they're really desperately in. You, the reason a lot of entrepreneurs are alco- or alco- are workaholics, <laughs> there's, a whole, there's a whole different reason they're alcoholics. Honestly, I'll just go to that for a minute. Entrepreneurship is super lonely. I hate that entrepreneurship is cool now because people that are not entrepreneurs are jumping in and it is a dangerous, lonely game. If you're not a purebred, you will get eaten up. If you don't love losing and love the struggle and love the pushback, you will lose. You will be unhappy. But the reason that a lot of entrepreneurs are workaholics is because they love it. They got lucky. They like literally love, like I remember not loving it. I mean, being in school, looking at the clock from first period on, those days, one day in high school feels longer than the last decade of my life. (laughs) I mean that. And I know there's an enormous amount of people here at this right exact moment that are already counting down Friday. And that's not good. And that's not good for Chase, and that's not good for them. And so we need a better debate. And it starts with what we spend our money on. A lot of people are like, Gary, but how am I supposed to live in New York City? I'm like, don't. (laughs) Like, don't. Like, Like, we have to get more binary around happiness. I really believe that. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt your uh, video. I'm just giving you this call for my number uh, to let you know that you have to join my text community. Uh, 212-931-5731, hit me up with a text. I have um, the real pleasure of getting to talk to a lot of young people in my job here at this company and I feel that even from an entrepreneurial level within the company that people are afraid to take risks. Well, I was a communications major, so therefore I have to go on the communications path and then I have to be a more senior communicator. I mean, a place like J.P. Morgan Chase, you can, like Mary said, you can 
move to London, you can move to Dubai and take a risk, but people are terrified. Trish, so pe- people are in the business of no. People are in the business of saying no before they asked. People prefer to blame the machine. I'm, I'm aware, I have it at Vayner. I have a full hardcore open door policy, but some people would rather go to the bathroom and vent than actually talk to me when I've proven over the last half decade how unbelievably safe it is to talk to me. So how do you, how do, you do it? How do you push yourself to take a risk? Practice. Hmm. What do you mean? I've been thinking a lot about this lately. I think you have to challenge yourself. Listen, careers are a big, per- the reason I talk so much about work is it's a scary percentage of our entire life. The amount of time you spend working in comparison to everything else you do is when you add sleeping into the equation, it gets really intense. So I really push people here and, and how do you do it? If it's too hard to do here because you were a student and you're in a machine and now you're this, and it, like, you have to try to do things outside. Like, I actually think somebody here off of this talk who then goes and tries skiing, I don't know why I'm stuck in that today, for the first time and never was a skier or cooking or going to a, you know, an opera, doing something completely uncomfortable may start the process of them doing something uncomfortable here. I think it's practice. I think you need to, by the way, let me give you, a, I like to go literal once in a while. Some, I'm hoping one person does this. Go volunteer at a nursing home for one day in your life. A, I think you'll get a lot of value of what I talked about earlier because perspective is the game and you can get it real quick if you go into that jungle. And B, that's you doing something uncomfortable. I think people have to break patterns. I think you do something different or, or build courage to do something different by getting used to it. The great fortune of my life was I was an immigrant who got picked on for not being able to speak English. I was a terrible student. I was not good at sports. I basically lived the first 18 years of my life telling me that I was a losing player. So I got real cozy with losing. I love losing. It's why I associate so much more with people that don't come from privilege. You know, whether they look that part, and I look, I view privilege first and foremost, we don't have the, you know, we can see a white male looks privileged. We can see somebody who's well off financially as privileged. The real privilege game in our society is what's going on in everybody's dome. Mental privilege is number one, right? I, when I, that's, I'm, I, I wish, this is why I'm talking so much about parenting. We are living through the worst execution of parenting in our society because we're living through such enormous success, abundance, and prosperity in America for the last 60, 70 years. And so now parents are getting into things, you know, parents during the Great Depression struggled with going to school and yelling at the parent, at the teacher for not doing this, that, or the other thing. So we're, we're living in eighth place trophies, fake environments, entitlement. There are kids in this room right now who take money from their parents and are over the age of 22. I believe that that is the number one poison in our society. I believe it creates enormous fake environments. It subconsciously tells children that they're not capable and they need their parents' help. And uh, fake environments are bad. And it leads to bad behavior. We don't, do you know that our society doesn't talk about saving money at all? We don't talk about saving money at all. We don't talk about borrowing money from our parents and paying them back. That's what two generations ago used to do. Now we just, we're so fucking entitled. We just expect. This is what, you know, everybody always asks me like, hey, how do I manage, you know, these millennials? I'm like, with empathy. They were parented in an environment where if you came in ninth, they clapped for you. (laughs) I I don't, listen, I think this is a super important subject matter. I'm not saying boo somebody and make them feel like, I believe in, I'm a product of self-esteem. My mom did the greatest job of self-esteem, but she also created accountability. Like, and we really need to debate that. So, you have kids. Yep. A little bit older. Ten and seven. Ten and seven, that's right. So, I know so many kids as a a mom of teenagers who are struggling with the existing classroom format of you have to go to class for 45 minutes and take English and then math and then science and, and they're struggling and 
it feels like it's a broken education system relative to where the world is moving and this entrepreneurial spirit, yet they still have no choice but to go through it. So what advice do you give your kids? Listen, I'm a hardcore DNF student, so I'm not interested in hypocrisy. My daughter, who's 10, looks like she's a big time student. I think she studied more yesterday than I did in my entire career. <laughs> and, I, and that's awesome. I have no interest in frowning on that. Um, I think that's great, and as long as that makes her happy and we have proper conversations around that. I, I don't think my son's gonna go exactly that route, but for me, it's not about demonizing the system. It's about, it's about having a 360 conversation. I, I have no interest in my children being entrepreneurs. If they happen to have that DNA, and that makes them as, the only thing I want my kids to do is be as happy as I am in what they do. You know, if they look at my, and look, now there's a new variable. Things with me continue to grow. I'm very empathetic that they may look at it and be like, I don't want any part of that. And I'm gonna go to Peru and give away all his money, right? And I'm good with that. I really am, I'm really good with that. Like, like, I really, really just want them to find their thing. And if their thing is something that I, you know, maybe I'm not as passionate about, which is, be more within the system, create less risk. My kids could say, you know what, I hate entrepreneurship. It made dad travel a lot, I hate it. That makes sense to me. And so my biggest, pa- my communication with my children is more about them truly looking for their happiness and understanding that the world will evolve quite a bit by the time they hit the real world and, um, and leaning into the happiness, but practically. You wanna go paint with tomatoes in Peru? That's amazing. Just FYI, I'm not giving you one dollar. And, 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 and that's amazing. Like, like, like to me, if they're gonna like live with like four friends in a commune, that's tremendous. That's awesome. Like to me, it's just about merit and happiness. Practical optimism. So this is a um, early in career audience that you've got here. What is some practical, actionable advice that they could take away and how are they gonna advance themselves, advance their careers from a personal branding perspective? Something they could walk out of the room and do immediately. So my number, number one thing that I think may be very unique and couldn't be more passionate in delivering to this audience is the following. I really highly recommend that you die on your own sword. Let me explain what I mean by that. Every day, A lot of you are in meetings where things are being talked about that you may have some insights, opinions, and actual knowledge about, and you are not communicating an opposing view because you know that it won't be accepted by the managers above you, and you think it's a vulnerability by communicating it. And I think it's the reverse. I think there's an incredibly soft and respectful way for you to create a data point to the conversation and that I believe this is what I see a lot happening, where people don't say anything because they're appeasing how to move up manager to manager to manager. The world actually changes and then the company resets and the executive by not saying something gets viewed upon as that was their point of view and they get hurt by pandering to the machine versus by being historically correct in the room when all those executives either grow within the organization or disperse to other organizations, they become an interesting prospect to bring along because they were historically correct. I'm giving advice that I take as an entrepreneur. My businesses are always much slower and smaller up front because I'm often talking about and executing on something that hasn't been accepted in the macro yet. And all the upside is on the back end. I think people in here are sitting on their words and they shouldn't and everybody knows it. This entire room is in meetings every day where we talk about things that they don't agree with and they don't say a single word. I don't think you should say them the way I do. (laughs) I say them aggressively in my Jersey style because I have nobody who can fire me. (laughs) No, I mean that. The client can fire me and then that, that would be my fault. But I understand why executives can't do what I do but, there's, but if I was a senior executive or my first day intern, knowing my communication style and DNA, I would just do it very politely and soft. But I would say, look, I don't think banner ads 
you know, even though the data shows that it's doing well, I think we're only looking at short-term conversions and not factoring in LTV and it has declining CAC and what's the value of that customer. You know, I would share my thoughts. The key that I notice is, but you have to know what you're talking about. Where a lot of people get caught is they think they know what they're talking about and then they say something and they're wrong. One of the things that's super interesting to me is I talk about a very narrow thing. I stay very narrow. I'm just not interested in being wrong. So I actually stay quiet. For all the talking I do, I'm quiet around 99.9% of things. That's why I don't get involved in a lot of other subject matters. I could talk about marketing. I could talk about the Jets offensive line woes. You know, I could talk about wine, but I keep it narrow because I don't know about healthcare. That's for sure, every one of us does, but that's not the kind of thing that I would stake in the ground for you know, career advancement, <laughs> you know? So you do know a lot about wine, so tell us, what's your favorite Sauvignon Blanc and your favorite Cab? My favorite, so, my favorite Sauvignon Blancs tend to be from the Sancerre region in France um, because I tend to like stony, flinty flavors more than the grass that you get from New Zealand and more than I mean, I think California Sauvignon Blanc sucks. Um, so, so Sancerre, Lucien Crochet is a great producer, so I would say that. And then on Cab, I think Cab is the most overpriced wine in the world. Um, it became very popular. I think Napa Valley Cabs are wildly overpriced. Um, so for Cabernet, maybe a, maybe a Bordeaux-based Cab from the Medoc, um, because I tend to like a little more vegetal and nuanced flavors. Um, so, and by the way, it's similar to media. It's not that I hate television commercials, I just think there's better alternatives. I think there's better, if you love Cabernet, and I'm sure 90% of the people that like red wine like it to some degree to love it, I just know that there's alternatives in Portugal, alternatives in Argentina that can appease your big fruit silky, creamy, oaky flavors for a third of the price. It's never about anything other than arbitrage for me. So it's not that Napa Cab suck or Cabernet sucks, it's that you're paying for the brand of Napa Cab and you're not educated to know that you can get that fulfillment from the Prio Rat in Spain. Okay, one more question. And by the way, on that note, just to make a segue to some of the stuff I talk about, that is absolutely my thesis in marketing. I don't hate direct mail. You can show me direct mail that works. I just don't know if you've perfectly executed one mile radius Facebook ads with contextual creative to the person that's seeing it. That's all. How did your wine business lead to VaynerMedia? That. When I had the awakening at 34 of like, wait a minute, I'm not a great retailer. I'm a great communicator. I built this business from three to $60 million with no money because I was right about e-commerce. I was right about email. I was right about Google AdWords. I was right about YouTube. I was right about Twitter. All five things I just told you. You guys are youngsters. When I started winelibrary.com in 1996, people told me the internet was a fad. The whole thing. Forget about Snapchat or Vine or TikTok. The whole thing. You know, people that sold the yellow pages in a Chamber of Commerce event made fun of me as like, you know, like, this kid's, like, he's gonna be wrong. Like, he doesn't know, he's a child. And I was like, the consumer's always right. I don't even feel like I'm a human being. All I think I am is a pass-through to what humans are actually doing. I'm not right about TikTok. Humans are doing it. There's hundreds of millions of people using it. This is not prediction time. This happened. I love people like, what's next? You're Nostradamus, you predict. I'm like, I'm a post-game newscaster. <laughs> I'm not Nostradamus, I'm, I'm like Howard Cosell. This happened. Podcasting happened. He was a yeah. <laughs> LinkedIn happened. Like I've never predicted a thing in my life. I'm just not scared to execute on what's actually happening because I'm not in the business of making reports or politics my North Star. Why don't we open it up to the crowd? Sure. Let's go. Um, you probably need a mic so that the people watching the webcast can hear you. And there's one over there for next. How are you? Hey Gary, doing well. Uh, my name's David Davis. I think you're the man. <laughs> I have a question. So I'm a father. I'm 29 years old. I'm a four-year-old. My question pertains to 
you know, I'm, I want her to be safe. I want to try to, to some degree, help make sure she doesn't really get off track and provide her best school, best things like that. But I know that you have mentioned like your philosophy on your children. And just want to get your advice on, from a parent perspective, yeah. right? Like, w when do you kind of say, you know? Yeah, I got it. Thing? Look, first of all, my interest in giving any specific person parenting advice is 0.0. .0. I think, I think everybody needs to parent the way they decide to parent. I like communicating the alternatives to what I think is being accepted, especially no different than TikTok happened. I, I Gary Vaynerchuk, get over a thousand DMs a week on Instagram from kids that are deeply resentful of their parents for over manipulating their lives. I'm talking about I hate my parents because they pay for my Equinox and Uber. I reply and say, then stop taking the money, dick. <laughs> but I also know what's going on at a higher level, which is parents are using their children as products to impress their contemporaries. The reason parents pay is not necessarily because they want to help the kid, it's they want their friend, their sister, their, their parents or others to think little Johnny and Sally are successful. So you need to do you, but let me say this. I don't understand why people can't remember them being kids. Like, I love parents that are like, I restrict my kids' time on their phone. I'm like, they've seen porn. <laughs> you know, like, like this notion that like we can control life is laughable and more importantly, we're giving indicators into kids that we don't trust them, which creates self-doubt, which really leads to a lot of unhappiness. So look, you get to pick your North Star. My North Star is self-esteem and accountability and happiness. Not Harvard, not entrepreneurship, not winning, you know, that. I want them to be happy big time. I want them to be accountable. If, you know, I'll never forget, I struck out four, I was a really good baseball player in third and fourth grade before talent kicked in. <laughs> and this one kid, John Longo, was a real pitcher. Big, fat Italian kid. If you're watching, John. Um, <laughs> and because he was so big, he could throw gas. And he just overpowered me. And I went 0 for 4 and struck out four times, which was unheard of because I was really at like, my apex then. And I just remember my mom coming in. And I came in and started looking for excuses. Like, I should have batted fourth today. It was sunny. She was like, you struck out four times. Meanwhile, this was the woman who, when I opened the door for an elderly woman, at McDonald's once treated it as a Nobel Prize winning award <laughs> behavior. So she created enormous self-esteem but not delusion, right? This whole, listen, if you're five foot four and your parents are telling you, yes, you can go to the NBA Abraham, that's fine, <laughs> that's fine, but it needs to be added with, and you will be one of the only three people in the history of the sport. And oh, by the way, Muggsy Bogues and Spud Webb could do all these other things that you are showing that you cannot. <laughs> we, are, we are, like this, you can be anything delusion is what's leading to a lot of resentment and pushback. And so, I would just tell you that delusion, and more importantly, what you put on a North Star today will change. I mean, look, college is under siege. There's gonna be seven or eight colleges with enough brand equity in 15 years to maintain their spot but the rest of them are in real trouble. I'm 43 and I was making $5,000 a weekend selling baseball cards as a 12, 13, 14 year old and was considered a loser. Today, I'm in the Wall Street Journal because entrepreneurship is cool. Back then, if you didn't go to a great college, you had no chance of happiness or success. By the time your kid in 14 years enters the time to go into school or in 18 years comes out of it, I have a funny feeling the rules will be different. So keep that in mind. And, and I apologize, and you decide. You decide what that is. Not me, not the game, not your parents, you. You know, which is what gets me into process. 
Why do I want people to do what they love? Because like, if you're chasing something for affirmation, you're in trouble. I don't want the trophies. I don't want the accolades. I want the game. The truth. The truth. The truth. The truth is undefeated. That's it. And people are scared of the truth. That's the only advantage you have. There's so much content being produced today. The only way you actually can break through is your unique truth. It's just true. There's just a volume of creative and consumption that we've never seen before. So that to build, you've got to lean into your uniqueness. My truth of baseball cards and flea marketing and root beer and the Jets and wine, those are the unique things that make me feel a little bit different than others. It's also a lot easier to produce content when you don't have to think. My friends, it's a lot easier to produce content when you don't have to think. Document, don't create. That's right. And the reason I brought up document and don't create is I'm not scared of my truth, my strengths, my weaknesses. It's not fun when you're actively the CEO of a thousand person company to actively always constantly talk about struggling with radical candor, knowing your employee sees that and then they're sitting in front of you and you're dancing around. They're like, you know, like, they, you know, like, uh, you know, the last scene of Eminem. Eight mile, last scene, most important scene in, mu- in movie history. I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. In that battle rap, by him exposing himself, he left nothing for the opposing party. The most unhappiness you will ever have is the secret you're hiding because you don't want anybody to have that leverage. Once you let it go, you become fundamentally unstoppable. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Let's go to that lady first. We'll go to this gentleman next. Hi, Mary. Hi. I work closely with Trish supporting marketing communication. communication Awesome. Um, I'm a huge fan Thank of you. the Resi restaurant app. Yes. I know you're one of the founders. I am. Um, so I'm just interested in understanding better how do you decide um, in which company you want to invest in, on support, and how do you decide which industry you want to get into? I know you work with wine, restaurants, media, on um, social media, so just tell me a little bit more about that. Thank you. So it, it's really serendipity. Um, I started a fund. Uh, in, in at the same time that my friend Ben Leventhal was just leaving his current gig, we had dinner one night, and he's like, I have good news, Eater just got sold to Vox. Like, I'm like, I have good news, I'm starting a fund. We're like, maybe we should do something together. And literally, during that dinner, we were like, you know, maybe what Uber did for taxis, we can do for the supply and demand of restaurant seats. And that was our opening thesis, which was, why don't restaurant seats sell like airlines more than just like the same price? There was no supply and demand metric. Ultimately, that's not what Resi became. What we learned after 24 months was open table's not that good. So let's just go right at that. That's what we did and that's what eventually led <coughs> excuse me, to its great success and the enormous exit we had recently. And so serendipity, I'm a counter puncher. I'm much more Floyd Mayweather than Mike Tyson. I don't like wake up and like, I'm gonna go kill that. I'm more living, living, listening, listening, listening. I'm like, oh, sports agency too. As much passion as I have to buy the Jets, I never viewed it as I'm gonna start a Jerry Maguire-like business and then buy the Jets. But then when I started looking and hearing, I'm like, oh, this industry could be disrupted. Um, So I spend a lot of time listening. I always say that to people that follow me most hardcore. I'm like, every second you don't see me, I'm listening. It's why I love Q&A. It's why I read my DMs. It's why I started my text platform because people feel even more comfortable telling me, I want the truth, right? That's where the real stuff is. I would have never gotten into parenting if, I mean, you know, I came from my parents giving me nothing. So I'm sure for a lot of, even when I said people complaining about their parents paying, you should have seen everybody's face here like, fuck, I wish my parents paid for me, right? (laughs) I would have never known that. I would have never known what kind of sadness people that were getting subsidized would actually feel. You know, we don't have empathy for other people's problems. 
We think our problem is the problem. And so, a lot of listening. That, and that's what my next businesses will be. It'll be because I've listened, did a little homework, see the blood in the water, shark it up. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. Um, my name is Doug Quigley. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. Actually, uh, well, thank you, right? So I'm here on behalf of my wife today. She's the executive director of a nonprofit called Chloe Kid. It works with children, teens, and adolescents with special needs, and it's a culinary program. Um, so during grassroots, she, about a year and a half ago, she quit her job, found this organization, brought her program to them, and now since then she's become the executive director. It's awesome. It's a great opportunity. She's very happy now. So cool. Um, so the, the problem that we're having, and I say we because I support her. Of course. Is, is how do we, when we apply for grants and um, foundation, you know, things like that, <coughs> and donations, how do we, without having a right track record of five, ten years, a lot of the organizations already have people they donate to. Of course. Things like that. How do we grab their attention with meaningful content, documenting things that we're doing to really you know, change the, the conversation around the special needs community? By doing that. If you listen to the way you just said it, the fact that you know that it's content, which it is, communication is how everything happens, documenting it, which you understand, it's kind of like you saying, how do I get healthier? You know, I know I have to eat better and work out every day, but how do I really do it, Gary? I'm like, by eating better and working out every day. <clears throat> You're talking about a lack of patience. No nonprofit that has no awareness and didn't exist should be getting an overflow of donations. That's not how it works. You need to put out content. You need to devalue the production value and upvalue the output. And that's it. Now the tactics of do you run ads against high net worth individuals on the Upper West Side? Yes. You know, like you fish where the fish are, but it's just making content and making sure it's seen. Whether you have no money and have to go organic LinkedIn and TikTok, or whether you do have money and then all of a sudden Facebook, pre-roll, YouTube, Instagram story, swipe up ads become your framework, that's the game. Rinse and repeat. Thank you. <clears throat> You're welcome. He's got questions. There's two up, gentlemen up here. There's a young lady right there. Let's go right there. <clears throat> well, you'll go to her next? Yeah. Awesome. It's you, bro. Oh. Yeah, congrats. <laughs> How are you? I just wanted to thank you for being raw, real, and honest. I really appreciate that. That's why I call you. I thank you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Mike Shimano. I work in digital account opening. I just graduated from Seton Hall. Go Pirates. <laughs> um, I'm in a lot of meetings every day. I'm in mean, yep. like six to eight. Yes. Day, and sometimes I'm not always the one that's effective in the meeting. It's like, do I need to be there? Yes. And sometimes I do get to run. Now, when I run meetings, I see two ways that people do it. One is the productive track. They come in with an agenda, an idea, and why it's working. Yes. And the second is the creative track. Yes. Hear yeah. Out. Yep. Time. Yes. So I was wondering, what is your favorite To make them way less long. <laughs> but to answer your question, both. I think it's important to have a Swiss Army knife. To your point, sometimes I'm going into the meeting because I need more context. And then I'll go creative. Um, and sometimes I'm trying to deliver something and I'll go more tactical. I think they both work. I just think they all run way too long. There's not a single meeting that anybody in this room has been on that wasn't too long. I fully believe that. You. You're welcome. Hey, Aaron. How are you? I'm good. Good. Um, I'm a big fan. Thank so you. So in creating all the content that you create and speaking your truth, have you ever thought about creating your own reality TV show? Um, no, but I do think the vlog has a little bit of that. Obviously, you probably know this. I'm quite private. You know, I share nothing about my family or personal life. Um, so, I don't, like, I, the reason I, first of all, I would, have never, I would never let a network have that much control or economic upside knowing the world that I live in. But even then, I have too much empathy for them because they would want all the other stuff and that's just a line I'm not willing to cross. So, no, um, but, but I definitely think the vlog and what we do at Daily V gets into the nuances of it um, and I enjoy the, con- the ability to control the narrative and, uh, and not do hellacious things for Nielsen ratings and you know, I'm, I'm just not willing. Listen, I am never ever going to be part of a machine that I don't control because it doesn't sound interesting to me and uh, that's why I would never do that. 
Got two over here, one back there. Mike? Yeah, you two can just, I have no preference of who gets the question. Yeah. Just as many as possible. Hi, Gary. Hi. Uh, no thanks. Hey, Noah. I want to say first off, thank you for bringing your content coming up two years ago and um, actually use a lot of the stuff that you taught to work on some outside work that I was able to bring inside work. That's cool. I any, everybody following because there's a lot of stuff you can actually apply to the job here. Thanks, Noah. Um, <laughs> the question that I do have is the one thing I do struggle with, Please. especially I know you're talking about patience and yes. but like the idea of focusing on one thing, you know, that book came out, everyone's about focus on one thing, develop that one skill, versus also where I feel I kind of know where I have a lot of interest, where I want to dive into a lot of different things. But sometimes I feel bad about it because I'm like, hey, I don't know if that's the right path. So what is your opinion on sticking to one thing? Or- I'm, I'm fundamentally the byproduct of not sticking to one thing. Like, I'm in the business of trying to juggle 50 balls and knowing 13 of them will fall and being thrilled about that because I have 37 balls in the air because if I had one ball in the air, I'd want to call it quits. And I think you should do what you want to do. You know what I mean? Uh, you know. Last thing, I put a lot of content on like health and fitness on LinkedIn. Love for you to check it out and see what you do. I will. <laughs> Noah Banks. Noah Banks. Uh, Such a good fucking name. <laughs> <clears throat> I will. Yeah, but bro, and this is for everybody. This will always happen. There are fundamentally, it's very historically true. There's the black and white way and the gray way. And things ebb and flow. They have their moments. I don't even know what book you're talking about. Focus on one thing but it has its moment. And then next week, some young lady's gonna put out a book called Do 64 Things, and it will have its moment. (laughs) This is a self-awareness game. I'm not right. I'm just comfortable doing me. I'm just hopeful you can do that too. There is no right. You wanna be type A, cross every T, make 700 lists a day, amazing. Just make sure that that you're doing it because that's how you like it, right? That's it, there is only the way that, it, you will always win when you lean into your natural upside. People are, our society is built to sell you on closing the gap on your weaknesses. All the upside is tripling down on your strengths. Hey Gary. How are you? James. James. Uh, Rockwood, New Jersey, so shout out to Dover. I love it. Um, just had a quick question about failure. Yes. What, is your biggest failure and what did you learn? Jeez. Um, I think my biggest failure was working every minute of my 20s. And when I say every minute, I mean all of them. Like no weekends, no friends. And I think I over, I was just too hungry. You know, like, that's why I've always liked Kobe. You know where it's like, a, like he gets a little like, it almost feels like it's a little evil and dangerous. I'm like, I get that. Like it was, I went too far, balance matters. And I think I resent and regret, and, and I really don't, which is why I even took a pause. But I think the biggest thing I learned about that is, you know, it wouldn't have killed me to you know, go out a couple of Friday nights. Um, so I think I'm more balanced at, at 43 than I was at 23. But bro, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm really trying to manifest an answer for you. It's unbelievable how much practice I have on the inability to dwell. You know, I passed on Uber twice on the angel round from one of the people that I was best friends with while investing in a bunch of other things and that $50,000 investment would would be worth $900 million. That was a mistake. (laughs) You know? Um, there's, There's so many mistakes. I mean, like, I make a mistake every day of my life. Like, a lot of them. Like, especially now where I'm crippled by opportunity like, you know, every, every day, I'm, I'm fundamentally sure of the following sentence. Every day I'm making pretty big mistakes because I'm saying no to something that could have led to the big thing of happiness or success. I'm just not crippled by that. I just don't understand why people spend time on that. Do you know many people that are in college debt spend 80% of their downtime being resentful that they took on debt for something they've come to realize didn't bring them as much value in return. The problem is it's over. Like I'd much rather, if they took all that time garage sailing and going to TJ Maxx and flipping, they could start chipping away at the debt. We have, one, we have time for TJ Maxx is loaded with arbitrage. 
<laughs> it is. You go to TJ Maxx, spend $1,000 and make 4000 on eBay and Amazon every day of the week. But instead of making that $3,000 of putting in work instead of watching Netflix or going to do something else, people would rather sit and complain why they pay. People would rather sit in a bar on a Friday afternoon, buy an $18 cocktail and complain that they're in college debt than do what I just said. You say you sound very eloquent and you're able to deliver on what you say, so curious to hear that. Nothing. <laughs> I just lived. I, I actually think that's the answer. I believe that a lot of people overcorrect with tutoring. Make, I believe that humans, especially today, are making mountains out of molehills. Like, I'm sure my team that's here will tell you the company-wide emails that I send or the things I run in Slack have no grammar structure whatsoever. I don't even think grammar structure's a word. Like, like, <laughs> like, nothing, bro. You know why? I don't give a shit what they think of how I'm talking. There are, there are people right now that didn't like that I cursed four times during this talk and decided not to hear everything I just talked about. I can't control that. <laughs> I can't. And, and more importantly, I bring this up now in the meta because if you're one of those people on simulcast or in this room, if that's what you're deciding to focus on, there's a real problem. There's a real problem. In life, you find what you're looking for. In today's climate, in society, I promise you the following. You wanna find a lot of negativity, it's very easy. On the flip side, a much more unpopular opinion is if you wanna find a lot of happiness and opportunity, you can find it very easily. You decide. I love that. You are in control. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone.